Good afternoon, everybody. All right. Let, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Yay. And welcome to the Aspen Institute. I'm Janet Topolsky. Um, and on behalf of the Aspen Institute Community Strategies Group, which I direct, and the Rural Development Innovation Group, I want to thank you for joining us today for the third in our America's Rural Opportunity Series, Lunchtime Dialogues. Um, I, as I said, I'm Janet Topolsky, and I, I run the Community Strategies Group here at the Aspen Institute. And our, in our work, we connect, motivate, and equip local leaders across the country who are trying to build more prosperous regional economies and advance people living on the economic margins. A lot of our work for the last 20, 30 years has been in rural America. Now, the Rural Development Innovation Group, which is co co-sponsoring this with us is a group of 15 seasoned rural economic development practitioners who really want to shine a light on what is working in rural America and what kind of strategic investments and policy would help to improve rural economic development outcomes and results. So this series, the America rural, America's Rural Opportunity Series, is part of that shining a light on what is working. Today's session, and each one has a different theme, There's, there are going to be six in the series at least, uh, today's theme is reframing natural resource economies. Now, natural resources, land, water, air, and what they make grow, are at the heart of our national economy and our global economy. Natural resources provide the inputs for almost everything else that happens that we make and do. It's important to note, though, that in rural places, ties to natural resources go well beyond the economic. For rural people, culture, family, history, way of life, all these things strengthen bonds to the land. And this bond is part of the core identity of a lot of rural people. And it's important to understand that. And that includes Native Americans, includes African Americans, it includes immigrants that have been living on the land across many generations. Natural resource development and maintenance for future use is almost exclusively a rural activity. This bedrock of our economic well-being really cannot easily relocate to cities. I just want to mention that. Right? So we know that a healthy and prosperous America depends on a prospering rural America, and therefore that won't happen without close attention to innovation in natural resource economies. So we are delighted today to feature three stories of that kind of innovation. Before we get today's stories underway, I want to introduce Carlton Owen, who is President and CEO of the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities. The U.S. Endowment is one of the three original investors in this Rural Development Innovation Group in this series, and Carlton will further introduce the theme for today's panel. Thanks, Jan. As a resident of Washington, D.C. from 1985 to 1990, when the temperature and humidity gets this high, this is a no-tie day, Robert Bonney. You can take it off. <laughs> and there is the moment it's going to be a no-coat day, and if it gets as hot tomorrow as it's predicted, it's a no-shirt day, so be prepared. <laughs> hmm. We're told that in the world there are two kinds of people, those that divide everything into two groups and those that don't. Uh, that you'll get a hint of which group I fall into. America's clearly a story of two different peoples in two different places. Our urban areas are booming, unemployment rates are low, investment is flowing in, and at the same time, our forgotten part of rural America that provides the water, the fiber, the fuel, uh, the recreation opportunity, and overwhelmingly, the men and women that make up our volunteer army that keep our cities safe often are falling behind. Over the years, those of us that have been concerned about that 80% of America have done a really good job of talking about all the benefits we provide to those citizens. And at the same time, we've been probably even better in talking about all the problems we have in rural America. And let's talk about what that's gotten us. Okay, that, that's about what it's gotten us. Uh, <laughs> deaf ears and not much. We point out that we've got overwhelming unemployment as compared to the cities, higher uh, rates of out youth uh, migration of youth, uh, opiate addiction, all kinds of problems, but we don't care about other people's problems, especially when each of us in our own homes have problems, and so it's very difficult to make that change. The visionaries behind this series decided that focusing on the problems wasn't getting us anywhere. They've turned the attention, as Janet said, to focusing the light on what is working. 
And so today we'll be looking at uh, pointing out the positives, the riches that rural America brings to the entire America. Resources, willing workers, opportunities for investment, and a quality of life, and so much more. The stories you'll hear are about rural entrepreneurs not whining about what they don't have, but talking about how they've taken initiative to use resources to pull together, especially governments and private investment and philanthropy to work together. Today's stories are representative of those new hopes and new investment opportunities. In fact, at the endowment, we're privileged that the three stories you'll hear today are all three ones that we have invested in over the past years. And we've done so with our partners at USDA. USDA Forest Service, Natural Resources Conservation Service, and Rural Development have partnered with us in all of these. My friends on the panel will share how rural people and communities are adapting and finding success even in the midst of overwhelming headwinds, and how philanthropy and government working together can develop deep partnerships and address those powerful resources for the future and the amazing opportunity for investment that rural America is. So with that, I'll turn it back to Janet. You don't want to hear from us, you want to hear from those entrepreneurs. Thanks. And before we get underway, I want to thank the organizations that have really provided support for this series, the Northern Forest Center, the U.S. Endowment, Aspen Institute, Encourage Community Foundation, the Lore Foundation, and we're happy to have Lamont Guillory, who is one of the leader staff leaders of the Lore Foundation, in the room with us today the Northwest Area Foundation, and all the members of the Rural Development Innovation Group. If you want to share your thoughts on today's discussion or send in a question, please use hashtag rural innovation. Uh, to get updates, you can visit us at as.pn slash rural and follow us on Twitter at at rural innovators. So to get started today, we're going to do this session a little different than the last that's three. We have three stories, and we're going to spend half an hour in each story. So at the end of each story, there'll be a little time for audience question from out there in uh, live stream land and from in the room. And then we're going to switch to the second story and then to the third story. Um, so I'm going to turn it over and hand it over the mic to Scott Tong, who will be moderating and probing today's panel. If you listen to radio as much as I do, and I listen to radio a heck of a lot. You know that Scott Tong is a correspondent on Marketplace's Sustainability Desk, and he focuses on energy, environment, resources, climate, supply chain, and the global economy. He's reported for more than a dozen countries, and I actually heard him actually do a story about Alaska earlier this week, which is rural, so I don't think you were in Alaska, though. From very far away. But we're going right to get him into more of rural America, so Scott, I'm going to hand it to you. Great. Uh, well, thanks very much, and thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, uh, on behalf of the decidedly non-rural people in the audience, my job is to be hearing your stories for the first time and to help you tell them uh, and to otherwise try to stay out of the way. So I'm going to jump in from time to time and ask you to, uh, to de-jargonize and, and tell it as kind of cleanly as possible. We're going to move quickly from each story. So uh, I, I may have to jump in and ask you to move on when you need to, but uh, these are great stories and I'm going to allow you to, to tell them. So the structure we have today is for each team. Uh, we're going to ask you to set up the context, kind of the, the challenge out there, and then to talk about what your innovation is from each entrepreneur. And then, I'm gonna, then you're going to talk about the impact of what it has uh, provided. And then I'll ask some questions, and then I'll open it up to the audience to ask questions as well. So. Um, so here we go. We have with us uh, Rob Riley is president of the Nor Northern Forest Center, and the organization creates economic opportunities from healthy forests in parts of Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and New York. So we'll start in the Northeast, and later on we'll, we'll go to other parts of the country. And Tabitha Bowling is our entrepreneur here. Uh, well, you started off here. You were in D.C. for a while, and you've moved up to Vermont not too long ago. Your <coughs> company is called Kingdom Pellets. So, um, Rob, let me ask you to start by uh, kind of setting the table. Great. Thanks, Scott. And thanks for everyone being here today. Uh, for those of you who have been to Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, or New York, raise your hands. Thank you. For those of you who have not, think of lots of trees, lots of rocks in the forest, stone walls, uh, peaks, uh, lots of water, and not a lot of people. We have 30 million acres, which is called the Northern Forest, and we have approximately 2 million people that live across that region. So about 15 people per acre. So that might be a little bit abstract, but we're in a largely uh, uh, treed area, and we like it that way. 
Um, many of you may know things of uh, the uh, 1980 Miracle on Ice happened in Lake Placid. We have the Von Trapp's Lodge in Vermont. We have uh, the highest wind speeds on northern uh, on Mount Washington in northern New Hampshire. And we have the L.L. Bean boot. You know, these are some of the hallmarks <laughs> of across this region that really hopefully personalize it a little bit for you. Um, but this region is not just about those, those images. It's really a, about a legacy of over a century ago. This place was uh, grounded in a, in a regional economy largely by pulp and paper. All the paper products, um, the building materials that came uh, out that helped construct uh, Boston, Providence, Hartford, New York, even probably down as close as DC, all those came from the region that we're from. Uh, vertically integrated paper plants used water power from that region, uh, added value to their resource, and then shipped it to markets, as I said, up and down the East Coast. Wages were really good. You'd go from high school across the street and you'd get a job at the mill. And then something happened in the 70s and 80s and 90s, and our challenge, as Scott wanted us to call out, was that the economy started to change. Other places across the country, across the world, started uh, outsourcing manufacturing. Uh, we saw declines of per capita income. In one case, uh, we have a community in central Maine that ha had the highest per capita income in the state of Maine that was based <coughs> on paper making in the 60s and 70s. It is now, unfortunately, at one of the bottom uh, scales of per capita income in the state as a result of this transition. And this is not unique to that one town. Nearly 50 communities across the northern forest and tens of thousands of jobs have been lost during this economic transition. Service sectors, in some case tourism, have filled some of that void. Those of you who like to travel, ski, uh, go to the, the region for the bed and breakfast experience, um, those, those uh, sector service jobs have, have grown. But in that transition, we've also experienced a loss of young people. Uh, people call it the silver tsunami. Um, I don't know if that's a very good term or not, but uh, essentially it's we're losing young people um, in fact, some of these mill towns have lost 50% of their population. So think about, on either side of you, your neighbor's not being there. It's a significant depopulation that occurred to, that really has, has really challenged these communities. So we're, we're going to uh, kind of transition on to Tabitha. Is there anything kind of finally you want to say to kind of move, move it over to her? The other context that you may know is that we're cold. This region is a very cold climate, and we send a lot of money overseas for heating this place. And we have really looked at how do we reimagine the, the, the type of markets that used to take the resource, the, some of the trees, into pulp and paper, and think about that from a, a local heat model. And that's where we inter intersect with Tabitha. So, we, so it presented a, a heating business opportunity. Is that right? Do you want to tell us about it? Sure. Sure. Actually, my story starts a few blocks east of here. Uh, I was living in Washington, D.C. Uh, just a few years ago, and it was a spring morning, nice warm spring morning, and I wanted to go sit in the grass with my son in Logan Circle. And I was going to sit right on the grass. I grew up in rural New York State. That was a pretty normal thing to do. Uh, but for my son, who had spent his first three years of life in an urban environment, it wasn't very normal. Uh, he was like, Mom, why are we sitting on the ground? The grass feels weird on my hands and it's prickly <laughs> on the backs of my legs. I don't want to do that. That was a very profound moment for me in understanding how he was shaping the world around him. And it just made me sort of stop and think, gosh, there's a, a moral imperative here for, for us as parents to make sure that he develops a strong connection to the land, to the natural world. And we realized, having lived in rural environment, excuse me, urban environments for 18 years, that we needed to get reconnected. So we ended up moving uh, to the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. It was a homecoming for my wife. Uh, she grew up there. And my son's the eighth generation to live in that part of Vermont. After we moved, I continued to work part time for my company here in DC, but was also looking for business opportunities uh, locally that aligned with my interest in something that was environmentally responsible but also supported the local community. Now, I didn't know a thing about wood pellets, okay? I didn't know that a wood pellet could heat something. Totally foreign concept to me. We do have some of these here. And they're right? here and, and they're going to actually have passed around uh, for you guys to see and have some context. So uh, our local school, our son's school, was advertising a tour in the paper to see this great new heating system and I was 
very intrigued because it was a cold winter and we needed to upgrade our heating system at home. So we went to the tour and uh, this heating system was installed with the help of the Northern Forest Center. But I gotta tell you, I was blown away by what I saw uh, in terms of the, the clean burning of the whole system, the cost benefits uh, to the school and to the community, and then the community uh, benefits as well. I was just uh, you know, totally inspired by what I saw, drank the Kool-Aid right there, uh, and decided at least initially we have to convert to wood pellet heating in our home. But I was also thinking the business mind in me, well gosh, can pellets be made here in Vermont? Are they being made in Vermont? How do you make them? So not too long after that, I was walking the family land with a forester and mentioned my interest in wood pellets. And he said, hey, you got to talk to my colleague so-and-so. Uh, he's involved in wood pellets because he's part of the state's uh, Working Lands Enterprise Initiative. He, he's the person to talk to. So I talked to Matt. And after a few conversations with Matt, I was pretty convinced that we could build a pellet mill uh, in the Northeast Kingdom. And he suggested I go to a forest product summit to learn more, maybe meet some partners. And two months later, uh, three months later, I did that. And I met um, my now business partner, Chris Brooks, who at the time was the only pellet mill operator in the state of Vermont in the southern part of the state. And I learned from him that uh, he'd been sold out of his pellets for six straight years with his operation in the south of the state and had 22,000 tons of unmet demand. Now, to try to put that in context, the average home uses about five tons a uh, heating season to heat their home in New England. And so you can imagine that that's a lot of homes that we can heat, so a lot of demand. Uh, so for me as a business person, I felt affirmed, okay, you know, we have the, the affirmation from the county forester that we have the raw material uh, to sustainably harvest and support this great product. We have the market demand, and I found a proven seasoned operator that I can partner with. So we started talking. Uh, the one thing we were lacking was a site. We needed to find a place to build this mill. And uh, a tip from the Northern Forest Center led me to a site in Lunenburg, Vermont, which is about 18 miles from where I live. And it is home to currently a hydropower plant, but it was a paper mill. And just to give you some context and bring it down to the local level, this paper mill back in its heyday employed 12,000 people. The entire county in which Lunenburg resides now has a population of 6,000, and that town has a population of 1,300. The town is the third poorest uh, in the state, and the county has the highest unemployment rate in the state. And so this is a job-scarce area, an economically depressed area, and so you can imagine uh, you know, what a, a pellet mill or anything that brings employment opportunity would mean. So I'm going to uh, Go uh, apologize and, and, and cut you off and uh, cut me off uh, and, and ask uh, Rob to talk a little bit about kind of the broader picture here. You have this pellet mill which is going to break ground soon. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So in the you fall. haven't seen all the local impacts yet. But what are the kinds of impacts uh, this can this can produce? Great, thanks. So one of the things that, that we know in our region is we use disproportionately um, uh, more oil, 80% of, of the number of the nation's number two heating oil in our region, meaning that 80 cents in every dollar leaves it. So if you plug that little hole, which is a very big hole, and keep those heating dollars local, we know that retention of wealth in a low resource area is going to be pretty significant. Northern Forest Center has been involved in putting 140 different uh, boilers, they, you might know them as, as furnaces, you walk down into your cellar and it's things that, that heats your home, it's a centralized system that basically next to it has a, a bin or sometimes an oil tank would be the comparable in the fossil fuel world, well we can replace that and it can be delivered in a truck that looks a lot like a fossil fuel truck, an oil truck and put into your basement and automated and you don't have to go down and do anything. Um, we have the technology, this is what Tabitha has in her basement. Our hunch was that this was unknown widely across the region, that people could use wood pellets locally uh, resourced from our land. So we really looked at how do we create demand by targeting specific communities, Berlin, New Hampshire, which is an old mill town, then up in the Northeast Kingdom, Linden, uh, New Hampshire, Lindenville, excuse me, Vermont, as well as Burke. Um, the town school was the anchor. It was uh, how do you get kids to understand that you can heat locally and you can actually feel good about it. That's the thing that's amazing about it. people feel good about how they heat. 
It's a nice emotional response. The economic side is really impactful. Of these 40, excuse me, 140 installations we've been a part of that have been supported by a number of different philanthropic uh, sources like the U.S. Endowment, but also USDA Rural Development, EDA, Northern Border Regional Commission, our federal partners have helped support the demand side for this resource. The 140 boilers have led to uh, more than a $5 million economic benefit to local community by retaining that dollar in the community, as well as helping to build the supply chain, as we call it, the people who are in the woods bringing the forests out and then milling them and then getting them from there to the home. So that we're creating, reimagining, if you will, a new type of energy system that comes from a sustainably managed resource in our backyards. Great. So um, let me ask you a few questions then, uh, specific, specifically about how this how this works. Then, sure. um, tell me a little bit more about how these are made. Sure. How we end up with this. Sure. So, you know, it, what we do is refining. It's a, it's a big refining process. So we start with round logs that come into a log yard. It gets debarked, so all the bark comes off, and it gets chipped down to sort of coarsely one to two inch size wood chips. And then that's dried uh, through a big dryer. I mean, a huge dryer. The, the drum dryer that we bought for, for the mill is 48 feet long, just to kind of give you a sense of context and scale. So it gets dried and then it's conveyed to a hammer mill, which pulverizes those chips basically into sawdust. And then we bring it into the milling uh, part of the process where that sawdust is remolded into rabbit food, or it looks like rabbit food. Mm. Uh, and, and what's great about softwood, this is an all pine, 100% pine product, is that there is a natural binding agent in pine called lingon. At pine tar, when you get your Christmas tree, if you get a Christmas tree, sometimes it's sticky, that's that. But it's a great binding agent for forming a pellet, and it also can get very, very hot. So the heat threshold on a wood pellet is about 75% of the heat threshold for heating oil. But it produces only 5% of the CO2 emissions per pound than mm. heating oil. So, so I, I do want to ask you uh, about the emissions, but it's first kind of the fundamental business case here. Sure. Um, so if I'm a, a homeowner and I want to kind of move over from heating oil, what do I have to buy to, you sure. know, to, to be able to be your customer? And why is it kind of in my interest to do that? Well, so it's a good question. There, there are two tracks you can go down in terms of uh, heating with wood pellets. There are stoves for secondary or what we call supplemental heating, or if you're in a small home. A lot of people in our part of the world live in small homes. Uh, so you can invest in this heating technology by buying or upgrading your stove. There's actually a lot of change out programs that are offered through the states uh, to get incentives. To buy the, yep, exactly. The hardware. Uh, we took advantage mm -hmm. of uh, those kinds of rebates to install a central heating system that's based off of wood pellets uh, for our house, which is again delivered as as uh, Rob said by truck and through a hose into a bin into the house, and the furnace just calls for the pellets as it needs to heat the home. So uh, those are the two ways that uh, a homeowner could make a conversion to wood pellets. And, and kind of going forward then, is wood pellet heating, as far as my fuel cost, is that, does that, is that competitive with heating oil? It is competitive, uh, but obviously the fluctuation of oil prices mm -hmm. is out there, it's yeah. volatile. And last year, for example, when the oil prices dropped yeah. so dramatically, pellets were actually more expensive. Okay. And so, you know, that being said, it's also a very stable uh, raw material and stable pricing and so you know we encourage our customers that are more price conscious mm -hmm. that you know look for long-term stability in your budget right um, oil prices are very volatile unpredictable hard to, to project okay. what your what your budget is going to be for this year and the next year but the quality of life elements um, also play a big part you know, especially you know this assuming we open this mill in October and it's, it gets running, that residents in our area are supporting other community members. And it's supporting community members because you're supporting the loggers going out into the woods mm -hmm. to harvest the wood and the people at the mill that are working at the mill. And so that's, that's a pretty compelling argument. It's not different than uh, locally sourced agriculture and mm -hmm. supporting mm -hmm. the farmer's markets that are so popular well, now. Let me ask you about uh, how you think about it's being sustainable, renewable. Uh, uh, certainly some questions have been raised about 
the uh, the carbon footprint of this if mm -hmm. you're right, taking away trees that are that are carbon sinks that mm -hmm. could be one one impact of that and and some have raised the question of how quickly do these trees grow back so uh, don't need to go into the weeds of that but how do you think of this we're burning wood here you know, as as being renewable sustainable uh, great question and from a big picture perspective the wonderful thing about our landscape is trees grow if anybody uh, goes and, and has lived on a farm in New England, trees want to grow in those fields. It's just a natural cycle. One thing we've seen over the last uh, 40, 50 years is an increase in stability of forests such that they're growing more than they're harvesting. So that difference um, really allows for the, the big picture carbon sink that uh, we want to be doing in our part, contributing to climate change mitigation. The second piece is that as we look at this being a largely private owned landscape, mm -hmm. um, large landowners, small landowners, the ability to manage their woodlands for different market outlets, whether it be saw logs that are going to go for construction or for the smaller logs that are going to go into, into local heat, that allows us to look at keeping forests as forests. It's a very simple term, mm -hmm. but essentially, uh, it's a value stream that al allows the economics of a person or a family who needs to pay taxes, who needs to keep uh, a forester involved in their management, allows them to do some upgrades, and allows them to um, manage their forest for its best ecological purposes as well. So we have both the ecological, the economic, and the social component of s local stewardship is really a, a very strong ethic in our region and one that is, um, is really a, going back to the local agriculture. Um, yeah. It's uh, how do we contribute to that, that uh, local c economy. Okay, one quick question for Tabitha and then I want to open up to the audience. Uh, as the entrepreneur, um, what advice, tools, advice, uh, or most important, as you kind of accumulated along the way, you're about to take your idea to market here? Sure, that's a good question. So, you know, I would say, first of all, I knew nothing about the forest product sector. I came from a casual goods background. <laughs> and so I think uh, the first and foremost would be ask for help. You know, be uh, open to admitting that you, you don't know and you need to learn. Uh, I found in Vermont a very welcoming climate of support locally on the state level and on the regional level. And without those helpers, um, we wouldn't have been able to finance this project and navigate some of the hoops that you need to jump through from a grant funding perspective. I was new to writing grants, you know, and, and got some good sage advice on how to do that. And so I think you know, sometimes there's a tendency to think that you need to be independent and not ask for help. and ask for help. Uh, I think that's first and foremost. There are a lot of people that are advocates that want to see you succeed. Great, great. Any questions from our audience here? We have a couple minutes for that. If you can wait for the mic to come to you, thanks. I heard the Henry Hedger. I heard that the, the burning wood pellets is uh, much more satisfactory than burning lumber. Uh, there's just to say split wood, not atoms, up that way due to the nuclear plant fiasco. But I wondered what are the byproducts of burning wood pellets? How serious are they uh, when compared to, say, natural gas or even oil or even coal? Coal, we know, is, creates acid rain and is a, a very serious issue. But what is the issues with uh, wood pellets burning them? Sure. Uh, thanks for the question. I think when we look at um, the notion of burning any type of fuel, it depends upon the appliance that you're using. Um, those that we're using in this region are ones that are largely modeled on and imported from the European Union, which have very high standards for emissions, both from a greenhouse gas carbon perspective as well as from a particulate perspective. So we have very clean uh, burning appliances. Um, we, we do have a challenge in this world of segmenting what we're talking about. Um, we, we call this modern wood heating to, to, to differentiate it from uh, wood stoves which everybody knows and loves because they create great ambiance. But if you have old wood stoves, the amount of smoke and particulates, or even just a regular uh, fire in a fireplace, contribute to a, a, what is a negative um, uh, perception of heating with wood. 
So there's a lot of science, and you sound like you want to go down this path. We can share with that with you around the differentiation among the other fossil fuels. But I would flag that we had a recent study uh, done on the comparative greenhouse gas emissions. And um, uh, from a life cycle analysis, using this in, the, in our region and sourcing it, uh, we came out 50% better than oil and even better than natural gas based upon leakage and refinement and transport. Okay. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Tabitha. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so as we transition to our, our next team coming up, we're going to go to Coastal Carolina for our next set of storytellers here. And uh, first to come up is going to be Jenny Stevens, and she's from a group called the Center for Airs Property Preservation. Go ahead and start taking your seats here. I guess two main jobs for your center. One is to help protect heirs' property. Uh, there are title challenges for a lot of landowners or families owning land. I'll let you talk a little bit about that. It seems what's more important for our purposes here is you're helping your clients use their land to productive economic use. And I'll let you uh, uh, talk about that. Yvonne Knight Carter is on the other end here. Thanks for joining us. I see you're a fourth generation uh, landowner on your property that goes back to the 1880s. In, is it Monk's Corner? Monk's Corner. Monk's South Corner Carolina. in South Carolina. So historically yes. in your family, there's been cotton and tobacco and livestock, and now we have a, a timber story. So this is kind of a different business case here. So Jenny, let me ask you to start by setting the table for us. Okay, well, I, unlike uh, the northern area into describing coastal South Carolina, just imagine within 30 minutes to two hours, you could be at the beach. But for most of our, our uh, service area, it's very, it's very rural, and it's being encompassed by development um, from, we have major corporations moving in, Volvo, Boeing. Um, however, we know as people, as the population grows, there's a need for what? Land. And so for our, the challenge for us is that our landowners are land rich and cash poor. So the job is how do we get our families to keep this land in their, their family, but also generate income. So <clears throat> although the Center's Sustainable Forestry Program, it actually was a result of a philanthropic endeavor, but the Center has been working with landowners since its, its inception and specifically landowners who own heirs' property. And you already said, don't use jargon. So heirs' property is land that has been passed down without a will. Therefore, the families own it jointly. If you want to think about it, it's more a corporate status or fractionated land. So it makes it vulnerable to dispossession, but it also makes it harder for families to maximize the use of that land. Um, <clears throat> so. As I said earlier, um, for a lot of our landowners, and we work not only with just heirs property owners, but we also work with people like Ms. Avon, who has clear title. And the problem, though, is a lot of the land that is owned is either been lying dormant or it's forested, but it hasn't been properly managed. Um, so hence our sustainable forestry program, where we're, as I said earlier, we're looking at increasing um, the wealth of the family and reducing the loss of the land. So just give you a little context about land ownership among African Americans. Between the close of the Civil War to 1920, African American land ownership peaked at about 20 million acres of land. And about 80 years later, um, it has dwindled down to 7 million acres. And so if you think about, for that perspective, land is an important source of wealth for African Americans. So at the center, we are, as I said, trying to put a combination of providing knowledge, but also giving landowners tools. Can I just uh, <clears throat> ask you briefly to help us understand why has this amount of land dwindled to what it is now? What, what's well, happened? There are a couple of reasons that have been proven. One is heirs' property. Um, as I said earlier, if you're owning land as a communal ownership, all it takes is for one person to sell their ownership of the land and it can be lost from the family. Okay. The other issue is, well, the increase in property taxes. Um, as I said, they're land rich, cash poor. So mm -hmm. there's, it's, to them, land is more of a liability than an asset. Um, the other reason is 
development. Um, and it's and, been acquired by some of these correct. Uh, corporations. Correct. <clears throat> Hilton Head is a prime example. Okay. If you've ever been to Hilton Head, South Carolina, that is. <laughs> um, so in 2013, the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities, they had a theory. And that theory was if we could get African Americans to practice sustainable forestry, that it would increase their income as well as building their land asset value. And the other thing was that if you resolve the issue of fractionated land ownership or heirs property, and we help the rural landowners clear title, that you could possibly open the door to land, utilization, land use options um, and increase the likelihood that these landowners would hold into this land and as they have in the past, continue to pass the land down through generations. Um, so Miss Yvonne is not, uh, as I said earlier, she doesn't have um, heirs property, but she is one of our participants in our sustainable forestry program. And um, Great, so let's focus <coughs> on uh, Yvonne's story. Right. The part of your work where you're working with your clients to take their land and mm -hmm. put it to better productive mm -hmm. economic use. Okay. So Yvonne, uh, help, help us understand your story. I understand it started with a newspaper article you read? Yes, and I'm Yvonne Cooper Knight Carter, and my sister, who's my partner, is Elna Cooper Brown. I had to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we formed what we call Broad Axe Branch Partners. And uh, the land was uh, in our family since the 1880s, as uh, Scott said. And my grandfather farmed the land and produced cotton, tobacco, uh, corn, and had livestock for market. Uh, my father later sharecropped. And I was away from home for a number of years and came back to the land. And so far as I was concerned, it was woods. And didn't have the faintest idea about what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Until I saw this article that said the federal government was giving funds to uh, assist minority landowners in maintaining and preserving their land. And I recognized the name that was in the article. Uh, Alex Singleton, who was a forester in our area, called him. He referred me to Sam Cook, who was a forester at the Center for Heirs Property. So from there, after meeting with Sam for a number of times, trying to understand what he was telling me, um, my sister and I decided to become involved in, in the program. And we, uh, I attended a lot of educational workshops. And one of them, um, a presenter talked about land ethics and you know, what is your perception of the land? What do you think about the land? And that started me to thinking. And then I said, well, what can we do with this land? So we decided to become involved. That was June of uh, 2013. We invited, or no, really didn't invite. Sam came out with, <laughs> with um, NRCS, National Resource Conservation Service Agent, um, a consultant that had been working with Ayers Property. And we walked, talked about the kinds of trees that we had on the land, what the invasive species were, um, space for wildlife, et cetera. After, again, meeting with the consultant over a two-week period, I guess, asking lots of questions, we decided to hire the consultant. And with uh, NRCS, you all know what that is by now, because we've said it, um, myself and um, the consultant, we came up with a plan. He had a plan written for us. And we began to implement that plan. We started with the soil preparation, and I hope this isn't jargon, but um, the first piece of it was drum chopping, which is a machine that goes over and just mow down everything, okay? Um, taking it all down. Uh, the chemical prep was in a helicopter coming over and spraying everything to kill what wasn't dead already. Uh, and then we went on to um, 
the burn and the Forestry Commission helped us with that. They wrote the plan and they also did the burn for us. And then we planted 85 acres of loblolly pine trees. I, I have to say the piece that's important to the management is that before you just left seed trees and wherever the seeds dropped, you, trees grew. But with the management piece, you're actually spacing them and giving them the opportunity to grow straight, grow well, and healthier trees. Um, therefore, you have a better value forest than you would if you just let it grow back naturally. Um, when I attended these workshops, I had light bulbs, what I call light bulbs. Realizations. One was we could derive continuous income from the timber if we staggered the planting. And if I could stagger the planting, that mean, means that I was going to be able to stagger the harvest as well, therefore the income. Learning from visiting a 2,000 acre forest, he's my idol, um, that you could get four cuts from one stand of trees. I know, Scott, you said stand. I it's, still don't know that. <laughs> it's an area of um, trees. Somebody help me if I, I didn't mm -hmm. say that right. Um, we, had, we delineated five stands on our property. So the stand that we decided to plant is eight, 85 acres. So we planted 85 acres of pine trees. The next realization that I had was um, after hearing a, an attorney talk about this, she said that, you know, landowners, it's like having a million dollars in a glass case and not being able to get into that case. So I felt like once we began thinning and clear cutting, we had tapped that glass case, actually broken it, and started to pull some of the millions out. You got um, it. Okay, and also the main purpose, I guess, for doing this was to set up for the next generation so that they would have a means to maintain the land in the family and understand the importance of what they have. Um, I guess you asked me what would I suggest to others? Well, um, before I do that though, our next steps is that we did a stewardship conservation program where we are hinge cutting and that's in five acres that I left within the, it was actually 90 acres and I'd left five acres for wildlife. So we went back into those five acres and did hinge cutting for wildlife. Um, what I would say to other landowners, minority landowners, any landowner actually, don't be afraid to take the step to try something different. Um, do your homework <laughs> and then understand what it is you're about to undertake. Now, one of the, a couple of the other things that we plan to undertake, my son does, I'm on the other end of the spectrum, is beekeeping and raising sheep. So that's two additional uses for the land. And in addition, we also lease for hunting and we lease for um, agriculture. We have a farmer operator who plants um, corn, um, wheat, and soybeans on some of the property. Great. So, so thank I'm going to thank you. Uh, uh, bring it back for a little bit to, to Jenny. So we mm -hmm. have this great story of land that's been repurposed for economic reasons. So you're growing mm -hmm. these. These are kind of softwood, kind of fast-growing pine trees. Is pine, that right? I don't know about soft, but um, pine trees, yes. Pine, okay. And Straighter trees. You've accumulated a lot growing. of great advice uh, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and money to be able to do this. And so I guess the question for, uh, for you, Jenny, to start out with is how do you kind of take a great story like this and scale it? How do you have broader impact? Two ways. Um, one of the things we've done is not only is Miss Yvonne one of the participants in our program, but we've created uh, a 
Woodland. A class of individuals we're calling our Woodland Community Advocates. These are landowners who have been through our program. Um, they have also, as Ms. Avon, they've, they've progressed down the road. So these are individuals who are sharing their story in their community, and they are encouraging other landowners to come to the center and um, learn from us, but also to get on the bandwagon to do this. Um, we're often in churches, community centers, sharing our story. And a lot of it is because of the Woodland Community Advocates. Okay, and the center is where some of this kind of knowledge and these people <clears throat> who've done it before, they come together and... Well, the center is, it's, it's the center's focus is land. Okay. So it, the land is either in, as I said, providing the legal services to help individuals resolve their title issues, because for most heirs property owners, they can't get a mortgage. Um, they cannot, they, or I should say, they have limited access to the conservation programs at USDA. So even though they may have this land that really can be an asset, it cannot because it doesn't have clear title. So our job is really about unlocking that potential mm -hmm. so that Before these land can. is, mm -hmm. yeah, so that the land isn't lost because that's the greatest thing. It's been proven that if people are utilizing their land and it's, they're generating income from it, they're less likely to sell it even if they're passing it down to another generation. Great, what, what else would you like to tell us about kind of the broader impact of the story? Like um, I think the only reason this story was, it came about, as I said earlier, is this was an idea or a theory that we're trying to prove through the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities, but I'd be remiss not to mention Forest Service um, of USDA and also the Natural Resource Conservation Service. One of our greatest evangelists is in this room, Robert Bonney, who was with uh, the Natural Resource Conservation Service in the sense that they help the word get out. Heirs property is not just an issue in coastal South Carolina. It's an issue all across the nation. So if we can have lower income folk learn how to tap into that potential in their land, they can become the solutions for themselves. They're not looking for a handout. They're generating their own income. And that's what the center is doing. We're providing the knowledge. We're providing the, um, the tools. And those tools, in many cases, were our partners. The South Carolina Forestry Commission, Clemson University, um, our funders, you name it. It wasn't really, it's not a one person thing. It has been a collaborative effort that has generated successes like Miss Yvonne. Right. And if I might add <coughs> that, you know, in the midst of all of what was happening, um, the, sec the United States Secretary of Agriculture was uh, in South Carolina announcing the allocation of additional funds and our farm was one of the site visits and he was actually in my home and I thought that that was just fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> right. so, so let me ask you, um, trying to understand all the organizations that were, were involved here. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm one of your neighbors who wants to do this, and I'm asking you, Yvonne, what, um, who's out there who can help me? And what can they give me? Without well, the acronyms, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the first things I'd have them do is to attend one of the really pertinent workshops with mm -hmm. the Center for Heirs Property. Um, because they really hold your hand through the process. But the United States Department of Agriculture, mm -hmm. the nice. Natural <laughs> Resources Conservation Office, is where you would start. Okay. Because they would have to fill out, here's the acronym, an EQIP application. <laughs> and you're applying for what? You're applying to be a part of the program to okay. see what kind of funding you can get. Okay. Because we actually did this with a cost share, and one of the, my realizations was it did, didn't have to come out of my pocket, so we did a thinning of one of the stands to generate funds, and we used those funds to supplement what we got from the USDA, I'm going to say USDA, uh, Natural Resources. Okay, so you're okay. applying for federal money, yes. federal help. Yes. Uh, and, and what other advice or help uh, did you need that you eventually got? Well, the Forest Service, mm -hmm. um, because it became a part of the practices that we needed to do. So uh, the Forest Service was the one that was able to do the burn for us. 
I approached them oh, to prepare your to prepare, prepare the soil. Yeah. Okay. So that's another farm services I used as needed because uh, she helped with what we call the tracks and the farm number and all of those kinds of things. And that's all a part of the process. And I tell people that you have to be patient because it does take time and, and you can't give up. You have to be persistent. Mm -hmm. And let me make sure I understand the business model. You have these trees, who buys them and what do they do with them? Well, um, we have a consultant who went out and look for the best prices and I knew that he would look for the best prices because the more money he made for me, the more money he made mm -hmm. because I, I paid him a percentage of what I would I get. Um, so that generated work for the consultant, it generated work for the logging companies, it generated work for the mills and um, Logging is a large industry in South Carolina, and we'd like to keep it going. And the mills, is this to, this is for pulp and paper? Is it for, for It's pellets? for m many different things. Okay. Uh, okay. You know, it's a process. It depends on what kind of tree they get off of your property. Yeah. Just want to add to that, mm -hmm. um, as uh, Yvonne was saying, forestry is an $18.6 billion industry in South Carolina. So can you imagine as African Americans not having the tools, but you have this resource, you too could be a part of that $18.6 billion industry. And that's the point, creating the systems to help landowners access and become, um, so as I said earlier, that they can generate the income for themselves. You've mentioned there are other, uh, other people in different parts of the country mm -hmm. that could kind of benefit from these programs and this knowledge. Tell us mm -hmm. a little bit about that. Um, actually, about a year ago, I sat on a panel with um, an individual who's a Native American, and the similarities between heirs property owners are a lot like those of the Native Americans who are owning their land in a communal fashion. So it limits the maximization or the use of that property. Um, and so also, I. One of our funders said that literally they could pick up the work of the center, the education, the legal services, and the forestry work, and take it up to the Appalachian. Skin color mm -hmm. of the client would change, but it's the same issue. And so just wouldn't want people to forget that. This isn't something that's just germane to the South. It can be utilized all throughout the country. So we've talked about the, the economic value that's gained mm -hmm. here. How do you think about the broader community value to this, the broader historical value uh, to, to, these, to these, these entrepreneurs and what they're doing. Funny you should say that. One of my um, advisory committee members pointed out how important property is or land is to African Americans. Um, and his quote was, as African Americans, we went from being considered property to owning property. And so, yes, most people may look at the land and see the dollar value, but we're looking at it from the cultural, historical. Usually, these were homes that, and we know the Great Migration, everyone went up north, but Big Mama and Grandpa, they always wanted that land in the south for folk to come back home and have a place to stay. So, but in addition to that is also the water quality that's being improved, the air quality. So while our landowners are generating income for themselves, they're also bettering the environment for their entire community. Great. Questions, please. Over here. And please introduce yourself briefly and ask your question. Um, I'm Lamont Guillory, uh, Lamont Guillory, the Chief Communications Officer for the Lower Foundation. And uh, we have a fleet of people tuning in on the live stream here. And I have a question from, uh, from J.R. Logan, who's a program associate uh, for the Lore Foundation. And his question is, when working with owners of heirs' property, how hard is it to get family members to agree to participate in this program? And how hard is it to get agreement on how the revenue is shared? Well, see, what had happened was... <laughs> <laughs> Um, agreement among families is always a challenge and we all know we don't all get along with all of our family members and we know them but for heirs property owners some of them have never met 
their cousins or however you want to look at it. So one of the tools that the center has created is what we call a family presentation. It's basically a legal education seminar in which we include mediation. Because nine times out of 10, when the family's talking about resolving the title issues, it has nothing to do with the land. It has to do with unaddressed family dynamics. And so until you address those, you're not gonna talk about the land. But I can tell you from our track record, for um, the families who've undergone or had the family presentations, about 60% of them agree to progress further down the road. Um, but sometimes it's the ones you think may not progress, because we've had an issue where two elderly folk, a fight broke out around the table. Um, but after that point, they have moved on and we're in the process of resolving their title. Great. More questions? There was one up. Please. Hey, um, I was curious. If oh, wait for the mic, please. And introduce yourself and your question. Hi, thank you so much. It was really informative. I really enjoyed hearing your story. Um, I'm Julie. I'm with the Appalachian Regional Commission, okay. just up the street. <laughs> and my question is just really a curiosity about whether in your area or beyond, if there's interest in non-timber uh, non or other woods product um, ag uses of the land. I know you mentioned some other products that you guys were exploring. And I'm just wondering about the level of interest, the level of returns, and what kind of um, markets you guys might see either in your region or beyond. What we typically do is, our focus really is about the land and working with those families. But we have other partners who are coming in from, um, one of them is, we call it low country, local first. They're working with um, individuals who are doing agriculture, they're planting uh, for, um, farms, gardens, whatever the term is. Um, so we connect our, our landowners with those other partners because that's not our thing, but we want to make sure that they are introduced to those individuals. So I can't really give you an answer about the demand for those services, but when our landowners do ask, we definitely make sure we're connecting them with the resources that we're aware of. Okay, I think we have question, uh, time for one or two more, if you have them. Please. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, my name is Aaron Slater and I work at the Center for Native American Youth. Uh, thank you both for spending time with us today. Um, I have a question about your family mediation programs and it, whether or not you uh, look at helping families maintain the wealth within the family itself and not sell off the land eventually. Uh, I think there's, a, from what I know, a uh, huge problem with family and business is that in like the third and fourth generations, there's often crisis time, totally. whether or not they'll stay together. And I was just curious if your family mediation programs extend that far or are that far reaching. Okay. Um, well, um, what I didn't say at the beginning is the center's it, full name is the Center for Heirs Property Preservation. So our mission is about keeping land in the family. So we don't really provide a legal service to individuals who want to sell their property. Now, in the mediation process, that will become evident if individuals want to sell it. But what we've discovered when we started doing the forestry program is that family members who didn't want to talk about resolving the title issue, they heard that there's a potential financial return. <laughs> if they resolve the issue. And that really, the forestry program became the carrot for a lot of our heirs property owners to see that there is a reason why you should resolve the title issue. Great, okay. Thank you to Jenny, thank you to Yvonne. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, for our last team coming up, we're gonna move out to the Western United States. Um, we have Nick Goulette and Robin Boyce. Nick Goulette is with Rural Voices for Conservation Coalition. The organization seeks to find common ground among diverse interests and it promotes balanced conservation-based approaches to ecological and economic problems facing the rural West. Next to me is Robin, Robin Boyce. You own Vineyard Ranch in Nevada. Um, and I saw from your introduction talk about a different kind of place. You're 90 minutes from your groceries and getting a haircut. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so tell us more about that uh, place so we can understand it a little bit, uh, a little bit more. But Nick, why don't you start out by uh, telling us about the context to this, uh, to this story. Sure. Honored to be here, everybody. Uh, my name again is Nick Goulet, and I actually run a nonprofit organization in Northwest California called the Watershed Research and Training Center. 
It's one of many community-based organizations, nonprofits, businesses, uh, environmental groups that work together to make the Rural Voices for Conservation Coalition. So RVCC is a, a group of 80 different organizations across 14 states, and we work at that, at that nexus of conservation, uh, public and private lands, and rural community development in the West. And so the West has a unique context, um, as all places do. Uh, many of you are well aware, you know, the West's made up of, of this matrix of, of public and private lands, with the vast majority being public lands across many states in the West. So tens of millions of acres managed by the U.S. Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, the National Fish and Wildlife Service, all federal agencies, uh, and that land is, is my land and that land is your land. And so public land has this really unique um, history uh, in terms of its development and its utilization. Um, early days, we moved out west and we were very utilitarian. We, we made the best use of those resources for economic benefits to help rebuild the country after World War II, for instance. Um, our values as Americans around public lands and the laws that govern them shifted in the 1970s. And uh, the rural communities that we built uh, to utilize natural resources in the rural west uh, bore the brunt of the conflict that has come since that time. And so folks know about the timber wars. Um, more recently, uh, many of you are probably aware about the armed takeover of the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge in the state of Oregon. Uh, that is a conflict over public lands and the utilization of natural resources on public lands. And so rural communities in the West that are tied to natural resources uh, are in a constant state of working through that conflict. And so the Rural Voices for Conservation Coalition uh, works to try to resolve those conflicts and to help empower those communities uh, by building their capacity to take advantage of the new opportunities in managing natural resources for climate resilience, biodiversity, clean water, clean air, those public benefits that, that America says we want today from our public lands. And in the process, uh, we still utilize wood for fiber, uh, for timber, for the things we build our homes out of, for wood pellets. And we still utilize the rangelands to produce beef that at least some of us enjoy. <laughs> and uh, so we have this history of conflict, um, but we're finding ways through it. And, and Robin's going to tell you her story about collaboration, about basically getting together at the table with those federal agencies, uh, with those st stakeholders who might disagree about how we ought to manage the land to, to find a new direction, uh, to get the social license, the permission to manage that land so that we don't end up in either litigation, so one pole litigation, environmental groups typically are, are going after the federal agencies to stop things from happening, or arm takeovers uh, of our federal lands. There's a huge space in between. Um, but like in, like in Washington, D.C., finding that middle ground and finding those, those solutions that provide certainty for landowners and businesses who are, who are the core of economic activity in these rural communities uh, is challenging. And so it's hard work, it takes time, and, uh, and the businesses and the workers and the communities that depend on that common ground uh, are all relying on uh, the kinds of organizations we work with as Rural Voices and the kinds of landowners uh, like Robin Boyce who uh, are willing to set that table, come to that table, um, and over time find those opportunities that look like sustainable uh, economic opportunity using what are usually renewable resources to sustain all of those conservation values that Americans hold for our public lands. Uh, so, so I just want to ask you, Nick, but before we go on to Robin, help me understand from far away, historically, how did we end up you know, largely in the American West with this challenging checkerboard of, fed, of uh, public and private lands that, are, that seem to be at the source of these conflicts. I will skip the war and genocide 
And because <laughs> that's part of the history too. And that history is part of the conversations we have at the local level and people should be aware that's not a dead history, that's a live history. Indigenous people still live in the West and, and people who, who lived through that. But how we did that was the American government wanted to settle the West. They offered land grants to people who were willing to move West and people took them up on that opportunity, picked, picked the best parcels that were the most productive and the federal government uh, took the rest. So forest lands of the Pacific Northwest, dry forests of the Rocky Mountains, deserts, rangelands that Robin will tell you about across a state like Nevada where something like 85% of the land is federal, uh, un under federal ownership and management. Great, okay, thanks. So, so Robin, uh, your rangeland, uh, uh, some of that is public land, is that right? Yes. Tell us the... <laughs> about some of the challenges and conflicts that you've been involved in and how you've tried to resolve it. Okay. Well, first, I'd just like to say thank you for inviting me. And I'd like to set the, the scene a little bit, if I may. Um, we've been in a collaborative team management team process for 20 years now. So if this were one of our collaborative meetings, we'd be sitting in a circle and all the barriers would be removed. And we out, we've started meetings with three questions for 20 years. You'd introduce yourself and state what your relationship is to the group. You'd state your expectations for the meeting. And then you'd, you'd tell us how you feel about being here. And that's how we've started meetings. And it's um, the circle, sometimes magic happens in it. Um, our, our story is embedded in conflict. Um, I moved to Nevada when I was 17 years old and it was the beginning of the heightened conflict that came about in the West. It was the beginning of some of the implementation of a lot of the environmental legislation that had been enacted from the 60s through the 70s. And we, we live, like you mentioned, in an area that's very different than this. It's um, very remote. We, between one town and the next, it's I think 69 miles and there's four ranches along that highway. So it's very different than here. And um, as you mentioned, we, Nevada is 85% public lands and most of that conflict comes from those social value changes and um, demands of different type of management for cattle ranchers like us on those lands. And it was about in the 90s, a lot of that conflict just was getting heightened. The Klamath Basin in southwestern Oregon uh, blew up. People were coming to meetings with guns. and. And there was just this heightened rhetoric and a real them versus us mentality that was growing at both poles of those interests. And along in that time, we were, came upon different information about livestock grazing and management. And it was kind of a light bulb going off, kind of an epiphany that we just never could look at the land the same after that. And so we decided to voluntarily make some, some changes. We have a BLM, a Bureau of Land Management permit. It's a 10-year lease for public land grazing. And we also had a, what we call a permit renewal. It was a renewal of that license, basically, that was imminent. And al along with that new information that came our way, there was, a, there was this new decision-making model of a collaborative consensus-based um, way to do business where you bring everyone to the table. We brought in and we chose to, to take that path. There were a lot of groups across the West that are well known, the Quivera Coalition in New Mexico, the Diablo Trust in Flagstaff, um, the Blackfoot Challenge up in Montana, and our small group, our original group, started in that time of the 90s. There was just this kind of countercultural movement 
that was really trying to find and define that middle ground that came, became known as the radical center to some, some of the people involved with it. And, and, and part of that is trying to address a triple, what we call a triple bottom line of ecological sustainability, economic resilience, and social and cultural diversity and preservation. And so we strive to hit those three targets and address those in our decision making. Um, again, part of that decision on our part in the 90s was we just didn't want to be part of the conflict for the bulk of our lives. And so um, we wanted an alternative to that. And so we chose this collaborative process. Um, in 1995, the neighboring ranch started a, a, what we call a collaborative consensus-based management team. In 2000, we started our own group for our ranch, and they're basically um, concerned with those individual ranch management through, through the course of a year. And um, that group eventually became the, what we call the Shoe Soul Management Team. We've celebrated our 20th year of working together last, last summer. And a lot of that success we attribute to really skilled facilitators that we have brought in from the outside originally to help us manage that middle ground and, and just hold that integrity that every, everybody gets to speak and there's respectful listening that happens. And, and we use what, what, what is called the Chadwick method. He was a forester out of the Northwest who created um, the Consensus Institute in Prineville, Oregon. And so that process um, was proven successful about 10 years into our team. We went into what's called, again, a permit renewal, where the Bureau of Land Management comes in and assesses your ranch. And you end up with um, how you will manage your ranch, basically. And our, we knew um, in the 90s that this was ahead of us. We knew that it would be appealed by one of the uh, more, ra what I would call radical environmental groups that's dedicated to removing graze livestock grazing off of public lands. And that appeal came with our permit renewal and our, our group was really um, stepped up to the plate and um, our state agencies in particular provided legal uh, documents or declarations in that, in that whole process. And we've seen great benefits. We've seen uh, stream beds repairing, or which are, we call riparian areas. And we've seen a lot of the native grasses and shrubs um, exhibit themselves in a more abundant way through the impl implementation of rest and just different management um, things. And we've also, we've created this while continuing to graze livestock through that whole period. And we've also um, been able to accomplish that through civil dialogue and, um, and look at litigation as a last resort, not, a, not choosing it as a first option. So Robin, I'm sorry to cut you off. I just want to make sure I understand when you talk about bringing the stakeholders to the mm -hmm. table uh, uh, to, to avoid, what is the, the bad case scenario you may have been through that you're trying to avoid here? Well, the bad case scenario would be a long, a long drawn out um, legal challenge where we would end up in district to your court. Permit request. Yes, just through take that our much permit request. To request renew yes. your permit to Greece. Yes. Okay. And okay. could end up in removal or a, a real reduction in. And has that happened to you? Have no. You, uh, okay. So you've been it able hasn't. to avoid. We've uh, been able to avoid that. that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so Nick, let me kind of ask you to contextualize this. Then it seems some of the other cases, the kind of the value of the innovation can be measured in revenue uh, or or jobs. This is kind of a different kind of way of thinking about deriving value from avoiding conflict. How do you, how do you think about that? Well, I, you know, I'd offer that there's, there's real impact, potential impact, if, if 
Robin and her husband lose half their herd to both the family and to and to workers. Um, there's also uh, this impact of this land tenure issue we talked about and heard about several times today. The private land that they own and hold is is tenuous as well, and so their private their public land allotment, their lease to public mm -hmm. land grazing, helps them to continue to own and manage the private parcels they have. As many folks know in the West, mineral, oil, and gas development is a huge threat. Well, how, however you want to think of it, huge opportunity perhaps. Mm -hmm. But it, it's changing land ownership and land use patterns. And so the threat here is that we, we go from a, essentially a renewable and sustainable land use to a one-time shot at utilizing land for a single purpose that contributes to climate change and other kind of, I think, mm -hmm. negative social, social challenges and is not sustainable. And so there's that, uh, certainly. Well, I think that there's also, um, it's a, there's such an interrelationship between private and public land, and that to sever that relationship is going to compromise both because of use. And I think there's also this public perception that that no management equals no cost and will result in dire, desired conditions on the ground. And I think if we look to the catastrophic fires in the Intermountain West, we see the cost of no management. And so I think that's a public perception that um, is a real challenge. You know, in, in so many businesses, people talk about uncertainty. Mm -hmm. is, is, is part of this collaboration approach where you bring the different parties, sometimes with different economic interests together, um, is does this collaboration help to remove at least some of that uncertainty? Is that part of, you know, if, if this is something that is scaled or can be scaled, is that part of the value here? It yeah, like yeah, I mean, so that is, that is, that is the theory. And I think it's playing out in the ground. And so when, when I talk about rural voices for conservation coalitions spanning 80 organizations and 14 states, uh, this type of collaboration is happening across the West uh, in these places where conflict and economic dislocation has been the rule. Um, we're finding ways to find that radical center and to create that certainty that investors want, that businesses and entrepreneurs want, that workers want um, from public lands that we haven't had for two decades mm -hmm. and, and trying to reinvent the business opportunities that, that align with the conservation values we have today. And so, uh, yes, it's scalable, it is scaling, and uh, we are seeing more investment in uh, in rural communities around the West because of it. Fundamentally, if you have uh, you know, a family or a company that's in the business of grazing, and then you have you know, in interest groups that are fundamentally against grazing, I'm just trying to understand, you can bring them to the table, but how, how do you go beyond that? If you, know, you have either, either ideological or economic interests that are fundamentally opposed mm -hmm. to one another. Well, some of them do not come to the table, and there's nothing you can do about that. All you can do is invite them, and... Who doesn't come? Do you want a name? Uh, <laughs> sure, I can report the story. <laughs> well, in our area, it's a group called Western Watersheds, and they're located in Haley, Idaho, and they will not come to the table, but you just carry on and you stay true to the values of why you started the group. And you can't get distracted by them because they will derail you. And so it does, it comes down to conscious decisions about land ethics and um, what kind of life you want to lead and doing the right thing. And from our perspective, I mean, there are many, many perspectives on this. Um, but I think um, to go back to your uncertainty question, I think that there's always going to be uncertainty. And if you've been in the public lands resource business, you, that's, you kind of buy into that lifestyle, I think almost, or it's imposed on you. And so these groups can almost create a community of certainty, even within the agencies, because our local agency personnel, um, it's sometimes discouraging to work for these agencies, and it gives them a, 
a different sense of purpose. It, it, in the beginning, it, we felt like we were the short straw that got drawn for the range person in our district office. Um, but now they want to work, you know, they want to work with us because they feel a, a sense of accomplishment that they're not feeling in the day-to-day -day job. So when you started this, what was kind of missing from your toolbox that you kind of accumulated along the way, either in funding or, or expertise uh, or, or grants? You know, what, who did you really need help from? Well, I think what was missing in the toolbox was that came to us was just the knowledge that there's a different way to do business. We've had a lot of partners. The agencies have been partners, different um, government groups. Um, Yvonne mentioned the Natural Resources Conservation Service. <laughs> and um, and we've, we've had a lot of support from that agency getting projects on the ground that increase the habitat qualities for wildlife and helping us do our grazing in a better way by water developments, different things like that. So. Great. Anything else you want to add before I open it up, Nick? Yeah, I, I think it's worth acknowledging the, that, like with the, the Northern Forest Center or the Air Center, you have these intermediary organizations in the West. There are several. Sustainable Northwest is one that I know worked with with Robin and her partners over time. They bring those technical resources. So the government obviously has their technical resources and grants that they bring. These non not-for-profit organizations also aggregate money from philanthropy and government. They provide technical resources, assistance, facilitation, capacity building, and marketing assistance for businesses, all of these kind of things that have to happen in between to get from, you know, a, a a landowner with an idea or an entrepreneur with an idea to you know a real viable business associated with with land that actually the the businesses don't own um, and so, so that's a big part of, of how this happens in the West um, and I think around the country questions please in the back I just have a, a question as to, have you looked at models around the world as to how other countries manage their land, in particular Europe, which is a highly dense, densely populated country, and it seems that their urban and rural relationship seems to be, I'm not an expert in, in this field, but it seems that that relationship is different from ours. Uh, ours is more disconnected. Um, have you looked at the European model? We can answer. Our, our, I mentioned the information that came our way. It was actually from Africa. And it was Alan Savory that some of you may have heard of. And um, so, yes, I mean, our, our premise is based on Alan Savory's time-managed grazing system but adapted to our area. I mean, we are in a very cold climate, very high altitude, and so there are just adaptations that had to happen. But that, that a lot of his basic ideas we've tried to implement at our scale. We're not in an area where we have um, small pastures. Some of our pastures are 30,000 acres, and you just don't want to fence them because we've got antelope and elk and deer and we don't want to fix more fence. And so we try to manage to um, accommodate some of that. So we have. It was based in, in some other, other parts of the world. Yeah. Why don't we take another? Uh, OK, let's, let's move on to your question. Um, can you, is it, oh, there we there go. You are. Um, Lamont Guillory with the Lore Foundation. Mr. Robert Bonney, Jay Caldwell from the Lore Foundation says hello. Um, Nick, this question's from you and it's from Ben Alexander at the Lore Foundation. Hey, ben. How is timber competing with marijuana in, the Northern, Cal in Northern California now that it's legalized in the state? Mm -hmm. how, how, how are you guys dealing with that? I'll t uh, I will not answer Ben's question directly and I'll, 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 I'll raise an issue that we should all care about which is cannabis cultivation on public lands. So their cannabis is legal in Cal state of California. It's legal to grow it on private lands, and there's a regulatory framework emerging for how to do that. It's certainly fueling economic investment and jobs in the place I live, and that's an important part of it. 
there is more cannabis growing on public lands where I live than there is on private lands. Mm -hmm. and, and so the scale and the impacts of that problem are not nearly daylighted clearly enough to the people of America. So I want to mm -hmm. welcome you all to take a harder look at what's happening on our public lands in the West and, and not just in the West. Um, and, and I'll back to have we looked at other models of, of land management. Um, one thing we know from around the globe is essentially it, land does not go unused. Right, and so we know from poaching in Africa, for instance, you can't just put a line around it on a map and say this place is protected. People are going to use land. And so our, our opportunity in the West is to find a way to use it that is better than the illicit ways people will use it if we don't use it for good. And so that's a huge topic, but um, one that's very relevant to our public lands in the West and I think economic development there. Okay, question in the middle here. Quick follow-up. Um, so is, are you aware of any public land, oh, sorry. Um, are you aware of any legal marijuana cultivation in the West on public lands? Not on public lands that I'm aware of. Thank you, just wanted to clarify. We actually okay. had a, yes. a marijuana farm in a very remote spring. We're moving on to the next topic. Um, I know, but I'm just, I mean where we live, for them to yeah. have found uh, out, it's, it is a, a real issue. And, <clears throat> Hi, I'm Phil Loomis from Right Work Labs. You seem to be saying that the quality of your work um, is the basis of your success. I wonder if you would agree with this. Uh, and of course, quality of work keeps going. You can improve your quality forever. I would say yes, but I would, I would encompass that quality of work, not only the land management, but the people part of it. That it's been the people part of it that has allowed the land management to take place. Great. Well, thank you, Robin. Thank you, Nick, very much. So, so I, I want to thank you all for coming today, both of you, both of you, no, all of you who are here in the room um, uh, live, as well as everyone who's live streaming. And I want to, uh, I want to thank Ben Alexander for lobbying in the question out there from about marijuana, which kept everyone sort of going. Uh, it's always good at the end to bring in a, a topic like that. Um, so thank you once again. Uh, as we've said before, this is the third in our America's Rural Opportunity Series. Um, I want to thank Robin and Nick, Jenny and Yvonne, and Rob and Tabitha, as well as Scott Tong for helping us today. Please stay tuned for the next in our series, which is going to be on Monday, May 22nd, and then the ever popular theme of innovative approaches to infrastructure in rural America. <laughs> See you then.